Good evening. We are so grateful that you joined us tonight. I'm Dr. Susan Hoover, and I'm an Associate Professor of Breast Surgical Oncology here at Moffitt. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to um, go over some housekeeping. Um, the content uh, tonight is not intended to be medical advice, and the viewers uh, should consult their physician should they have any questions. The viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you have a medical emergency, please call your physician or go to the nurse emergency room or call 911. Never disregard professional advice or delay seeking care because of information that's contained in tonight's webinar. We are so excited to have you here uh, this evening. We're gonna learn about some um, very innovative and new things going on um, from a research perspective for breast cancer here at Moffitt. On a personal note, I've worked both in academics and in the private sector. I worked at Moffitt years ago. I left and then promptly came back because I think uh, what was so attractive to me um, as a clinician at Moffitt is that we have such a true and genuine sense of collegiality, camaraderie, and when you have that amongst uh, medical professionals, it really fosters um, an environment and a culture in the institution that helps us to work together to bring science, um, the, the smart people, smarts all together in one place to try to further research um, developments, discoveries to help patients um, with breast cancer. So this evening, you're going to be your special group tonight. You're gonna to hear about um, what's happening in the breast department in terms of immunotherapy and things that we are doing and working very hard on to improve the lives of our patients. Um, you're gonna hear from three people tonight, uh, three people with whom I work. Uh, one is Dr. Brian Zernicki, who is uh, the chair of Moffitt's Department of Breast Oncology. He's also my boss. And he is a surgeon and an innovative scientist. He has a heavy clinical load, but still makes time uh, to um, go to the lab and find and discover things to help patients uh, with their cancers. Uh, additionally, um, I have one of uh, my medical oncology colleagues, Dr. Ricardo Costa, who is going to talk about um, his trial that is brand new and will be uh, recruiting patients uh, this year that is an immunotherapy uh, trial. And to kick it off tonight, um, we're going to hear from uh, another medical oncologist uh, in our department, Dr. Hatem Solomon, and he is the director of the clinical trials office at Moffitt. And um, uh, Hatem has uh, been the principal investigator of multiple trials, many of which um, are what we call investigator initiated, meaning he's come up with the ideas and the uh, thought process to put these trials into place to see if we can um, have some uh, new findings and discoveries in terms of uh, therapies for our breast cancer patients. So Hatem, if you want to uh, kick it off, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Susan. Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our webinar to um, give you some of the highlights and information about the exciting research that's going on at Moffitt Cancer Center uh, within the breast program. Uh, on, on behalf of all of us in the breast program, we're definitely um, very appreciative of your time and attention and support. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Solomon. As um, Susan uh, pointed out, I'm the uh, medical director for the clinical trials office at the Moffitt Cancer Center. I'm an associate member in the breast oncology uh, department. I'm a medical oncologist by training, but also specialize in doing uh, clinical trials uh, all the way from uh, early phase to late phase studies uh, for patients with uh, breast cancer. And so it gives me great pleasure to spend some time with you this evening to go over some of our trials. And uh, I just wanted to put this in for everybody because I do think that this kind of, um, you know, exemplifies a lot of what's going on uh, in the press, especially lately uh, with what's going on with COVID. No doubt everybody is hearing about, you know, trials being put on hold for 
vaccines uh, for COVID and, and other issues that are, are uh, constantly, you know, being um, communicated to the lay person, to the public. And I think it's critical as a public service, you know, that uh, doctors, particularly in research institutions, um, that they can do is to try to demystify clinical trials as much as possible, because this is the engine of innovation. This is what really allows us to improve uh, outcomes for patients and develop new treatments without having a clear understanding of clinical trials and their importance in medicine, in developing new treatments and new evidence for us to be able to offer treatments to patients. Uh, patients may not feel comfortable participating in some of these trials. And so it's incumbent upon us to use these opportunities to try to, in essence, lift the veil um, from clinical trials and help people understand a little bit more about what's going on. And that's part of my role. Um, as the medical director at the um, clinical trials office as well as finding opportunities to educate uh, all of our stakeholders as to how critically important clinical trials are to our institution. Next slide. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time highlighting um, some of the key points about uh, clinical research at Moffitt. So Moffitt Cancer Center is um, Florida's only uh, National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. So uh, what this means for everybody in Florida is that they have a center that covers all aspects of uh, cancer prevention, early detection, uh, treatment, uh, both standard of care and clinical research, survivorship, and also it includes education uh, activities, and also community outreach. So it's a um, wide swath of different activities that are offered at the Cancer Center with the mission of addressing Florida's needs and beyond um, for tackling the problem of cancer and trying to uh, find the cure for it um, as soon as possible. At Moffitt, we have over 500 active clinical trials that are open currently, and that number is growing uh, quite a bit day by day. So. It's a very active and very busy um, uh, initiative throughout the center. We have two dedicated clinical research units that are staffed for clinical trials. And uh, there may be a third one uh, that would be built across the street from the McKinley Center uh, in the near future as well. And so clinical research infrastructure is expanding rapidly. We have the third largest cell therapy facility in the country. Um, after our expansion, uh, this allows us to begin to ramp up novel clinical trials using genetically engineered cells that are obtained from patients' bodies in order to try to recruit their immune system. And that's the basis of uh, one of our trials that'll be discussed later this evening, uh, pioneering Dr. Cernicki's uh, lifelong work in the use of uh, dendritic cells, which are a type of immune cells to stimulate the immune system to attack cancers. And the cell therapies uh, facility is critical to that innovation and effort. We have over 1,200 patients that are annually treated on therapeutic research trials at the Moffitt Cancer Center. And again, that number is growing. And our breast cancer clinical trials uh, span across all phases of clinical research from phase one, which are the very earliest trials to try new drugs in patients, all the way to phase three trials that are used to register new indications for a treatment uh, through the FDA. Next slide. And so uh, this, this is trying to give uh, our audience a, a sense of the, the breadth of our trials and, and kind of not only kind of emphasizing that we do trials across the phases, if you will, from very early phase to late phase, but also we do multimodality and multidisciplinary research at Moffitt. So I, as a medical oncologist, specialize in the use of drugs and targeted therapies and also immunotherapy agents uh, for the treatment of cancer. However, our radiation oncologists are involved in some very novel and interesting um, precision radiation trials that are looking to see if we can tailor the radiation plan for patients with breast cancer based on the biology of their cancer or how they're responding to treatment. Um, furthermore, our surgical colleagues, including Dr. Hoover, um, do participate in innovative surgical uh, technique trials whereby they're trying to leverage new technology and techniques to try to make their surgeries more effective and more precise in the removal of uh, cancers 
while having the optimal and best um, cosmetic outcome possible for our patients. Next slide. So this is an example of some of the activities going on at Moffitt that are leveraging what we would call precision medicine and immunotherapy. And uh, this means that we are trying to find the right medicine for the right patient and deliver it at the right time in order to optimize their chance of cure. Um, immunotherapy is, is an approach where we're trying to recruit a patient's immune system to try to help them better eradicate their cancer and also improve their odds of cure. So our preoperative iSpy2 trial is a nationwide trial involving multiple centers around the country that have patients who are enrolled with breast cancer that has not been removed yet onto multiple treatment arms. Many of these include novel experimental agents, targeted drugs, or immunotherapies. And those patients are being matched to those arms by analyzing the genetic signature of their tumors in order to try to assign them to the best arm for their particular cancer type. And by using that precision approach, we hope to be able to deliver new drugs and new treatments that can cure more patients uh, more rapidly to the clinic. We also have trials that are using immunotherapy to recruit the immune system in the fight as well. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, we can harvest your immune cells from your body to make a personalized breast cancer vaccine in the lab and then administer that vaccine back to you in order to stimulate your immune system and get it to attack the cancer cells and eradicate them more effectively. Um, we also have trials that um, just recently completed, uh, but additional ones have opened now, where we use genetically engineered cancer targeting viruses that are injected into the tumor. And these viruses are able to specifically attack cancer cells while leaving normal tissue alone and causing the cancer cells to burst open. And that also triggers the immune system and allows it to fight the cancer, if you will, with the one-two punch of the virus attacking the cancer cells and the host's immune system as well. And these are very exciting trials that uh, have been leading at the Cancer Center for several years now. And then finally, we have uh, immunotherapy trials that stimulate uh, the body with chemicals called cytokines and other immunotherapy drugs that can activate the immune system and awaken it from its slumber uh, while patients are getting chemotherapy. Again, so that we can try to synergize with the systemic treatments that we're giving in order to better cure patients from their cancer. And finally, we have trials that are using what we call antibody drug conjugates. These are like smart bombs that have the chemotherapy or the anti-cancer agents attached to antibodies that specifically deliver those payloads to cancer cells while trying to spare normal tissues in the body and minimize toxicity to the patient. So this is a precision way of develop, uh, delivering chemo in order to cure patients of their breast cancer. And we have multiple trials ongoing using these exciting new agents as well. Next slide. Our radiation oncology trials um, use genomics to personalize radiation therapy. And our center has been one of the leading centers in the world to develop signatures that can be used to try to personalize the radiation treatment plan so that the appropriate dose is given to patients in order to target their tumor while maintaining uh, safety um, in the normal tissues. Our facilities are, are world-class facilities that can deliver very precise radiation plans uh, that target the tumor and spare normal tissue. Uh, and our trials also look at whether or not radiation can be avoided or de-escalated, if you will, in women who have exceptional responses to preoperative chemotherapy. And then also uh, we have trials that are combining targeted radiation with immunotherapy drugs for women with brain metastases. This is a particularly different, difficult group of patients to treat and trials are sorely needed for these uh, patients in order to improve their outcomes. And so these combinations are truly exciting and can offer some major opportunities for our patients to have uh, successful long-term durable control of the tumors in their brain uh, with these novel combinations. Next slide. And then this is an example of some of the surgical trials uh, that are ongoing, uh, such as uh, some of the work that Dr. Catherine Lee uh, has been leading that um, their trials uh, use special chemical probes that light up and fluoresce when a specific light is, is uh, shine on a cavity of a lumpectomy uh, in a breast uh, patient undergoing surgery so that a surgeon can accurately see where residual cancer cells may be lurking or hiding in the margins of the lumpectomy cavity. And what this does is allow the surgeon to uh, perform a more complete surgery the first time with negative margins potentially and not have to take the patient back for repeat surgeries. 
And so this kind of precision approach is something that would allow a woman potentially to have uh, one surgery uh, that allows her to conserve her breast optimally and um, have the cancer out and completely removed correctly the first time. Um, Dr. Hoover is also involved in, in launching an additional study which will use uh, novel uh, technology that can allow uh, surgeons to precisely locate tumors in the breast uh, in three-dimensional space so that they can um, have a better idea and plan for how they remove and excise tumors during lumpectomies. And uh, eventually over time, the hope is that in a virtual reality sort of way, surgeons potentially could use augmented reality uh, from these kind of techniques to allow them to perform ever more complex surgical approaches to deliver the best response, uh, best outcomes for our patients with uh, breast cancer while providing excellent cosmetic outcomes and improving their quality of life. And so this is truly exciting technology that's on the horizon here and uh, would revolutionize many of the types of surgeries that are performed at our center. Next slide. So I just wanna to emphasize to our audience that the future of Moffitt clinical research is very bright. And uh, we excel at using a multidisciplinary team approach to innovate new treatments. And that is at the heart of everything that we do at Moffitt to deliver world-class care for our breast cancer patients. We have teams of dedicated professionals uh, that are required to allow us to do these cutting edge trials. And they need our support and they need uh, an infrastructure that is uh, able to match the demands of our clinical trial portfolios and our patients as well. We need to leverage advances in immunology, genetics, machine learning, precision medicine to deliver the right treatments for each patient's case. And most of all, I wanna emphasize that it'll take the participation of our patients and the support from our advocates and financial sponsors to deliver the cures that our patients want, deserve, and need in order to have the best outcome possible. And uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody for their attention and support, and I'll hand it back over to Susan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hatem. That was just really a wonderful overview of what we have going on here at Moffitt. I mean, just really groundbreaking uh, research and using concepts and exploring concepts that are uh, going to change the face of how we um, treat breast cancer, especially with um, uh, something we're gonna hear about next uh, with Dr. Costa and immunotherapy. I, I wanted just to take another minute for some housekeeping. Um, if uh, you folks out there have some questions, if you go to the bottom of your screen and you hover with your mouse, um, you'll see a, a dialog box that says Q&A. If you click on that, you can type in your question and at the end of the program, um, we're gonna take your questions and then we'll have the panel up to answer them uh, for you. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to get to Dr. Costa, who is one of my colleagues in medical oncology, as we mentioned, and he has a brand new trial that will accrue patients this year. And I want to make note that his trial is made a possible by donations given to um, the Shula Fund here at uh, Moffitt for, that is specifically um, poised for breast cancer research. So due to generous donations um, from people just like yourself, uh, Dr. Costa has been able to get this trial up and running. So um, Ricardo, if you want to take it from here, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Thank you for the kind words. <clears throat> uh, Indeed, I'm one of the medical oncologists at Moffitt. Um, I'm a, also a clinical investigator. And I think most importantly, I'm a big fan of my patients that in clinics daily um, fight through the journey of um, 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 breast cancer treatments. Uh, and uh, I think it was inspired by that that I joined Moffitt about three years ago now to participate in this very um, fruitful um, environment that is really um, working hard to develop um, immune therapies for um, breast cancer. And this trial that Susan was um, alluding to um, has to do with two very important um, concepts. This is a very um, individualized approach um, to treat breast cancer and, and this has to do with uh, immune therapy. So we're basically going to be using uh, dendritic cells, which are immune cells, that are um, collected from, from the patient herself. And we are giving these, uh, uh, these cells back to the patient uh, in a way that will hopefully 
um, intensify anti-tumor um, activity. And the trial uh, is specifically for patients with a subset of breast cancer that is known to be aggressive. This is known as triple negative breast cancer. It um, encompasses about 20% of the cases of breast cancer, which unfortunately is a common disease, right? In our country, there are over uh, 200,000 new cases each year and 20% of that can be defined as triple negative breast cancer. And this is a tumor that is essentially treated with chemotherapy um, and in, in its most classic um, definition. Um, and it does come with significant toxicities. It comes with a, with a uh, significant cost or investment from the patient's um, standpoint in terms of the risk. And what this slide is trying to uh, depict to all of you tonight is that we need to do better. These bars are essentially trying to depict uh, the prognosis of patients with triple negative breast cancer uh, in terms of the probability of cancer uh, recurrence at five years time when they receive aggressive uh, polychemotherapy regimens. Um, you see to the left that there is a almost 30% probability of the cancer coming back despite surgical treatment, despite neoadjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy um, and uh, at times radiation therapy. And so this is a pretty high number that we, we, we really need to put all the effort to, to um, reduce. And most importantly too, when these, these um, recurrences take place, for the vast majority, they are in the form of metastatic cancer, meaning that the breast cancer cells they come back away from, from, from the breast, away from the lymph nodes in the uh, chest. It comes in the liver, lungs, or bones, and eventually um, leads to suffering and death of patients. So we really need to, to try to do much better um, for patients with early stage triple negative breast cancer. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I think we, um, yeah, can we, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have to ask a fundamental question, right? And I alluded to that before, which is where, where are we really? What is it, uh, how much have we um, evolved in the last few decades actually in terms of systemic therapies or chemotherapy uh, for uh, treatment of breast cancer uh, in the early stage setting? And really all we have thus far in terms of FDA approved um, treatments is chemotherapy that comes with um, Toxicities that uh, some of you may be familiar with in terms of um, hair loss, fatigue, um, which you know uh, some patients can even have uh, much more than that in terms of nausea, vomiting. So definitely a treatment modality that comes with a high cost from the patient standpoint. Next slide, please. And immune therapy. Uh, is one of the ways uh, that uh, we can think and, 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 and that we work on um, in terms of find a better balance um, between finding uh, a therapy um, modality that will um, show robust anti-tumor activity, but with a low burden to the patient in terms of the um, risk of side effects. If we, if we even look at the very um, uh, origin of the uh, the word uh, or the words uh, immune therapy that comes from the um, Latin, uh, one could translate that that would be a treatment that is unburdened. So this is what we're hoping to do um, at Moffitt is to develop immune therapy strategies that would come with a high efficacy probability with a low probability of complications. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, dendritic cells, uh, and Dr. Solomon alluded to that, and uh, that's, that's at the core of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the trial that I'll describe to all of you soon, are cells that uh, have the capacity to interact with many other cells that um, are present in our immune system. Uh, and uh, there are definitely robust data um, coming from uh, Dr. Zerniki's lab and also from clinical trials that are being run at Moffitt that indeed that, that, that really amounts to uh, increased anti-tumor efficacy. 
So this is what we really want to try to focus on with the, uh, the dendritic cell technology is really to find a robust way to activate the immune system in a more global way, um, perhaps in a, more, in, a, in a stronger way, even compared to certain antibodies that are currently available for other solid tumors. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a scheme that will, um, um, in a simple way, depict what, what, uh, what patients would, would go through to have uh, these uh, vaccines prepared. So you see uh, that uh, uh, the lady there on, uh, on the cartoon would depict a patient that would have a blood collection through a process called um, leukophoresis. And this blood um, will uh, undergo a series of um, um, laboratory processes in which the dendritic cells will be separated from, from the blood and they will be exposed to certain um, molecules that uh, we physicians call them peptides that will render them very sensitive against these molecules that we know are present in triple negative breast cancer. For this study, we call these molecules HER2 and HER3, um, that we know they're present in these triple negative breast cancers. And once we know that these cells are really active against these little molecules, we give the vaccine back to the patient um, in this trial, it will be given uh, directly into the tumor itself. Uh, and that's what we want, those immune cells to attack the tumor cell directly. And uh, that, that is uh, uh, um, uh, for sure a very individualized and precise way to develop immune therapy because each patient has her own treatment prepared by, you know, uh, uh, with her own cells and it's, it's, it's given to herself in a very individualized way. Next slide, please. So um, I think I'm getting ahead of the slides a little bit given my enthusiasm, but indeed uh, vaccines are precise and very um, individualized. Next slide, please. But we have to ask ourselves, how, how safe is this, right? Uh, we, we, I, 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 can't, I can't stress this enough. Uh, my admiration for my patients um, definitely come, come from their ability to, to make all the investment that, that, that they make in terms of um, sustaining toxicities from chemotherapy. And we want to try to find ways to minimize that. And the interesting thing, uh, which is very encouraging, is that the nutritic cells um, uh, vaccines, they seem to have a very low probability of serious and um, uh, uh, clinically bothersome side effects. Uh, this uh, treatment modality has been uh, assessed for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. And this is a different subset of breast cancer. In our department, we have treated many uh, patients with this uh, subset of breast cancer. And we have been very glad to see that in terms of toxicity, what we, we observe really is short-lived fever um, episodes, chills, muscle aches and pains. And these are usually very short-lived. They, they, uh, they take place for over, perhaps at the most 24 to 48 hours. They subside very easily with um, Tylenol, but that's pretty much it. We don't see a lot in the way of the serious toxicities that could eventually even uh, um, um, make patients go to um, emergency rooms and, and you know, um, and, uh, and really suffer from, from treatment. So definitely from the safety standpoint, a very interesting treatment strategy uh, if that should be pushed forward. Next slide, please. So the toxicity profile is favorable. This is a huge take home message uh, that makes us very enthusiastic about developing dendritic cells vaccines for aggressive subsets of breast cancer. Next slide, please. And this is the overall um, schema of um, the trial. The trial will enroll about 30 patients. This is what we call an early phase clinical trial. Um, and this is open label. Every, every patient will know that she is getting the actual vaccine, so there's no placebo here. And these are patients um, with this aggressive subset of breast cancer um, called triple negative, as I mentioned. Um, these patients will tend to have um, high tumors, uh, they tend to have node-positive disease, and these are features, obviously, of a higher chance 
uh, of cancer uh, recurrence in the future, a more aggressive um, um, course for the patient, right? So um, every patient coming to the trial will need to have that blood collection and uh, that procedure is called leukophoresis. And that's mandatory, obviously, for the preparation of these vaccines. And patients will be receiving a total of eight intratumoral vaccines. They will be given over the course of uh, four consecutive weeks. And they start before they receive this standard chemotherapy, right? I think it's nice to, to, to see that the way we design the trial um, uh, will not omit standard of care treatment because we want to know that these patients are getting good therapy uh, for their breast cancer too. We, we, we hate to, to omit treatments that, that, that can help the patient. So as I said, there's no placebo there. Uh, the standard uh, chemotherapy prior to surgery will be present, but we'll start before, we'll, we'll start these injections before the chemo. So we'll have an idea how um, um, efficient these uh, vaccines are by themselves in attacking the cancer cells. Um, so this, this would be the overall uh, study um, 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 schema uh, and uh, indeed we're very glad to see that we had uh, we had support we had financial support thus far to um, conduct this this uh, cutting edge uh, trial that is personalized individualized immune therapy based um, definitely I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be the PI or the principal investigator for this study next slide please and there is more that we, we are planning to do. Uh, we want to learn about possible interactions between uh, the patient's tumor and these vaccines and other components of the, uh, the um, immune system. As I said, the immune system cannot be viewed as only one type of cell. There are many cells uh, that need to um, interact um, so that uh, 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 the immune system can fight the cancer cells. So definitely there will be more studies and uh, tissue collection, blood collection, stool collection, why not? So uh, we can explore uh, other interactions and understand about the biology of these cells in the immune system when they are exposed to this uh, innovative treatment modality. Next slide, please. So I think if I were to summarize my feelings about this trial and, and my goal about, uh, with this um, study, I definitely need to gain knowledge. I need to st as, um, stick to the basics as a uh, uh, investigator. I need to gain knowledge about the safety of the, this treatment um, um, strategy and anti-tumor efficacy um, as well. We uh, definitely want to gain a lot of knowledge I think we can gain really a lot from this study in terms of interactions between uh, various components of the um, immune system. And I would summarize or finalize with the next slide um, by saying that the overall goal, our, our overall goal, and I'll go back to the beginning, is to go back to my clinics and not from my patient, better results with less toxicity. Um, and with that, I think this is my last slide. I would thank you for your time and um, attention. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Ricardo. That was such a great overview of um, immunotherapy, which is not really an easy thing to explain to doctors, much less people who are not in the medical field. So um, I appreciate you breaking it down to the nuts and bolts uh, so that uh, the viewers can understand what you're doing. Um, I also just want to point out that how important it is if you uh, listen to the message today, how safety is really important. I mean, these trials are so well thought through, um, not only to, you know, the end goal is to try to find treatments that are going to be better for patients, but you know, we do keep safety in mind and trying to make sure that we're looking at these um, uh, algorithms and these uh, treatments in a way that we can get what we want out of it, but not hurt people along the way, or at least minimize that. So um, thank you for the overview. I um, now want to introduce Dr. Brian Zernicki, who's the chair of uh, breast oncology here at Moffitt, and he's going to um, say a few words about um, what he's got going on. Brian. 
Thank you, Susan. What I thought I'd do is um, walk you through a couple of scenarios and a couple of patient interactions to get the true feel of what these guys do at Moffitt every day and the directions that um, we're going in and what we can accomplish now and what we can accomplish. So let me take you uh, to Wednesday at 7 a.m. I walk into the McKinley operating room and meet uh, a young 36 year old who's a Hispanic female, has four children, and is scared out of her mind going through breast surgery because she's just been through a clinical trial. And I will say the clinical trial she's just gone through is one of the ones that Tim mentioned in his first slide. Um, this unfortunate woman got uh, breast cancer and a big one, uh, probably around the size of a grapefruit in her um, right breast. And it was triple negative, the kind that Ricardo has just presented to you. She put, decided to participate in a clinical trial that Hatem was running where he um, developed a trial to administer a virus into the um, tumor and then give the standard chemotherapy to see if we could make the tumors disappear before surgery. Now, I will say that this virus is also engineered to make some immune um, molecules that rev up the immune response. And this is actually one of the final patients to participate in a trial that had Thames run, and he didn't mention anything about it, but that trial has actually doubled the complete response rate, meaning that all the tumors disappeared by the time the patient gets to surgery. What does that translate to? That translates into better survival. So I go into the uh, operating room and uh, perform the surgery and I have the pathologist um, look through the breast tissue and tell me what they see when um, I, I take out this breast tumor area and lo and behold, they don't see anything. The tumor's completely gone. Her lymph nodes completely show no longer any tumor and we knew it was in there from prior to the surgery. And I was able to go into the room post-operatively, um, into the recovery room, and talk to the patient and her husband and tell them the good news that her tumor was completely gone. Now, that's Wednesday morning. Let me take you to Tuesday in clinic. I meet a patient who um, is a 42-year-old um, woman who's not a patient of mine. She's a patient of one of the other um, breast surgeons. But she's uh, participating in a clinical trial of um, a dendritic cell therapy that we um, designed here at Moffitt. And the goal was to, in, based on a TEM study, was to inject these cells, which is the patient's own immune cells that trigger their own immune response, inject these into the tumor and her lymph nodes before she would get chemotherapy and this uh, antibody that's well known for treatment of HER2 breast cancer called Herceptin. So this is her um, final week of treatment. Um, and I walk in the room um, where the ultrasound machine is to give the patient this injection as the, the cells have come over in a syringe from our cell production facility right across the driveway. And as I walk in the room, the patient says to me, doc, my tumor's smaller, it's shrinking. And I said, sure, right. Um, so fortunately, we have an ultrasound machine um, there. We said, well, let's measure. Let's look. We knew what it was three weeks ago. Let's look and see. Well, sure enough, when we ultrasounded it, it was originally the same size of the one I just mentioned earlier, six centimeters, which is about the size of um, a good size orange. 
And now it's down to the size of a ping pong ball. It was more than half disappeared already with just immune therapy. So you can imagine that patient was pretty excited um, knowing that her tumor's already responding before even going on therapy. So we finished her injection and she went up to our clinical, um, our, our clinical treatment unit where we um, watch patients for a little while after they leave. And uh, I've heard since then that after her first chemotherapy dose, she can't feel her tumor anymore. Eventually we'll figure out in the next uh, four or five weeks or, or two months, whether her tumor is gone or not. Just like the first patient I told you when she gets to surgery. Let's go on to Friday. So I had about a year ago, I, I sat in a lunch seminar with um, a group of patients that are, have ER positive metastatic breast cancer. And they were rather disappointed that we didn't have enough treatments um, for people with ER positive breast cancer. There's people focus on triple negative and, and her too, and they think um, that they're a little bit of a forgotten group. So we had a retreat not long after that, where we have one once a year, we get all the faculty together, and we, um, we had a discussion about how can we um, improve the treatment for metastatic ER positive patients. And one of our faculty, Loretta Loftus said to me, why don't you um, target with your vaccine the estrogen receptor? And I said, that's an interesting thought. We've never thought about that. The following week in walks into um, my lab, a, um, a brand new college graduate from the University of Tampa who wanted to start working with us um, on cancer vaccines and, and immunotherapy. And I said to her, let's see if you can make a vaccine that'll target the estrogen receptor that we can use for um, patients with metastatic breast cancer. Well, we'll fast forward to last Friday at our afternoon lab meeting, and Gabby um, presents um, her data and shows me unequivocally that she has shown that the immune response can actually kill cells that express the estrogen receptor. And not only that, um, it's known in patients that have uh, received uh, estrogen anti-estrogen therapy for years and have metastatic breast cancer, that that receptor mutates. And what she was able to do is show that she could take all those mutations that um, vary from patient to patient, but are all in the same region of the estrogen receptor, and she could make a vaccine that would eliminate or kill those cells that had that receptor mutation. So, we are now at the precipice with that to be able to introduce in patients with metastatic ER positive breast cancer an immunotherapy that can target the estrogen receptor. How exciting will that be for those patients? Obviously, we need to um, raise funds to be able to um, perform a trial like that, but that's just an example of a few days in a week at Moffitt Cancer Center. And I'll tell you about one last one this morning. I had a, a phone Zoom meeting with a couple of scientists at um, University of South Florida who we have worked with on um, the gut microbes. Everybody is all excited about probiotics and the role that the gut plays in immunity. And it turns out that one of the postdocs there um, worked with somebody at the National Cancer Institute who has a big laboratory studying the microbiome, which is the gut um, flora. 
And we got together on this Zoom call and we have been doing some work that Moffitt funded uh, us to do on um, how the immune response can affect the gut microbiome and how the gut microbiome can make the cancer work with the immune response to make tumors disappear. And we had um, found this interesting phenomenon that if we took a mouse that had a, a breast cancer and we treated it with these same kind of dendritic cell vaccines that we give patients, if we injected that into the tumor and the mouse became cured of the tumor, and we took their gut microbes and we transferred them into another mouse that had the same tumor, with a little bit of immune therapy, it would make that tumor disappear completely. And we couldn't transfer any of the gut microbes from a healthy mouse, from a mouse that had another kind of tumor growing. It was only from the mouse that got cured of the breast cancer that we were able to transfer that. So just imagine if we can get the gut microbes to be able to be transferred from a patient that has a great response to one that has not so great a response. We may be able to um, affect more and more cures for any subtype of breast cancer. This scientist today from the National Cancer Institute got on the phone and um, he was more than interested in participating in a um, clinical trial with us to actually um, investigate whether we can transfer um, with immunotherapy for patients with breast cancer gut microbiome from um, one patient to another. So I hope you can appreciate that these are just a couple examples of um, the things that go on behind the doors every day at Moffitt Cancer Center in the breast department. And I wanna thank all of you for um, being involved. And, and I just wanna say that several of these clinical trials, including one that we're about to open for patients with metastatic HER2 breast cancer, have been funded by patients and patients with or, I mean, patient organizations. The, the, the organization Pennies in Action has funded several of these dendritic cell vaccines um, through their fundraising activities. The, the Blake family is um, funding a clinical trial for patients with metastatic HER2 breast cancer where we're gonna transfer lymphocytes and these dendritic cells to patients who have failed all of the therapies with HER2 breast cancer. And the Shula Foundation, as you've heard from Dr. Ricardo, is going to, um, we're gonna fund um, his trial for triple negative breast cancer. So we really rely on the, the goodwill and the philanthropy of um, many of the patients and advocates who are interested in breast cancer to help move these therapies into reality for patients here and now today. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Carrie Bean, who is our um, gift officer for the um, Department of Breast Oncology. Um, she, I think, is going to um, say a few words. Um, and then the, the group of us will be happy to answer any um, questions that, that you may have. And again, I want to thank you for participating in this um, evening. Um, um, we're hopeful that we can um, do this in person in the near future. And we are working on some COVID vaccines for patients with cancer to be, to be mixed in with our tumors. So we're, we're working on that approach as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zernicki, um, and thank you to each of the clinicians for participating today. I wanted to come on and briefly introduce myself or say hello to many of the friends that are on the call. And I am so glad that you all were able to join us and hear from this team of amazing clinicians and researchers about their work. What really stood out to me, and I hope it stood out to you too, is 
the compassion that they have for their patients. And each of them are so motivated and driven in this research to improve the lives of patients and improve the overall outcomes for breast cancer patients. So without further ado, I want to open it back up to them to the Q&A, which I think Dr. Hoover is gonna help moderate. But again, just wanted to thank you all for participating today and thank this amazing team for leading us through this fascinating discussion. Um, thank you, Carrie and Dr. Zernicki. Um, and I, I, I will um, support what you're saying is that, you know, philanthropy really does make research possible. We can do none of this um, without the help of our friends uh, in the community and Moffitt uh, supporters. I wanted, uh, if you could just indulge me, I wanted to just summarize a few things and we'll get straight to the Q&A. Please um, uh, put your Q&A in there, or your, your questions, and we'll answer them for you in just a second. And listening to everyone tonight, I, um, a few things came to mind. One, I, I wanted to, um, listening to Brian's uh, stories today, I had a patient on immunotherapy, and I remember I got, she finished all of her therapy. The tumor on exam had just melted away, um, both in the uh, breast and the axilla. And I got an MRI as part of preoperative planning and to see uh, the difference that uh, this wonderful therapy had made. And I was just uh, astounded when the uh, radiologist came out of their little cave where they read films and said, Susan, I, this patient's tumor has really responded so great in the breast, but she has this huge tumor now in the axilla in the armpit and I, I, I couldn't understand it. So I called Brian straight down. I said, you need to come down here and talk to me about this. You know, these, these immunotherapies are new and I, I just couldn't understand it. And I, I think my gut feeling when I looked at it is I thought, well, maybe the immunotherapy has just blown up this axilla and gotten rid of the cancer. And sure enough, Brian comes down as he does very leisurely and calm. And he looked at it. He didn't even hardly look at the screen. He looked at it and said, uh, that's the immunotherapy. You're not gonna find any tumor. And I thought, okay. So proof will be in the pudding. I did the surgery and sure enough, the patient had a complete pathologic response. There was no cancer anywhere. So I think, you know, this immunotherapy is new and it's teaching us things we never knew and on, on how things look at like imaging, how things can respond before they've even had therapy. Um, as I mentioned before, this is how we are going to cure breast cancer. Um, it's, it's, things of this nature. And again, without your help, we just can't do it. And then just lastly, one last comment, and we'll get to the questions. I want those listening to understand that, you know, at Moffitt, we don't work in silos. We don't work by ourselves in a very narrow focused way. In the breast program and all the programs here, we're all housed under one roof. So the surgeons interact with the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist. We answer to one person, uh, Dr. Zernicki in our case, and this allows us to have lifetime think tanks and to kick around ideas like, what if you did this and what if you did that? And I think uh, that really sets us apart from other institutions and myself having worked at some very well-known institutions in Texas even, I think that um, my attraction again to Moffitt is this camaraderie. And we can assure you that if you entrust any of your uh, donations and your philanthropy to us, it's really going to go um, to very good use. And we are very judicious and mindful and good stewards of anything that you have to offer us. So without further ado, um, I would like to get to some of the Q&A. If everybody can pop their screens back up so the viewers can see you. I think I'm going to try to go in order if that's okay. Um, with the questions that we've received. So thank you so much for all the questions. We have one, and whoever wants to take a stab at this one, um, what trials use the dendritic cell immunotherapy is one of the questions. And as a, as a secondary to that, can Dr. Costa's immunotherapy be used for a grade three tumor that has been removed that is not triple negative? Brian or uh, Ricardo, y'all want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, sure. So I think in terms of which trials uh, have used and uh, use the this very specific type of uh, immune therapy, uh, we have, uh, of course, 
past trials and uh, ongoing trials and even future trials. Even uh, this morning, um, we had our uh, weekly research meeting and uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Heather Hahn, was already presenting a new concept for patients with yet another subset of breast cancer uh, called HER2 positive. So, um, and this would be for patients with early stage. So um, trials in the past, they primarily focus, uh, focused on HER2 positive um, breast cancer and um, certainly uh, Dr. Solomon and uh, Zerni can speak more about that. Uh, so there are many trials in the past and many trials coming down the pike for sure. This is a very dynamic field in our department and we're really trying, trying, to, um, trying to push as many trials um, as possible. As far as the uh, second question, can patients with uh, high-grade tumors participate into the trial? This is a good question, thank you, because one of the um, considerations that we made was not to make the inclusion criteria for the trial very strict in the sense that the definition of triple negativity is pretty strict, right? Um, meaning that there should be none, none of those little antennas or receptors seen at the rim of the breast cancer cells uh, so that we would call the tumor triple negative. But for this trial, we are allowing for some degree of expression of estrogen receptor positivity. Uh, patients with those tumors, uh, these, these type of tumors are called uh, ER low positive. So I think we gotta see, you know, case by case, but uh, yeah, we will give some leeway in terms of enrolling patients with uh, triple negative cancer, but also with low expression rates of estrogen receptor positivity. Uh, but I think the question was a little more specific. The question was more for patients that had the tumor resected um, already. And this, was, this would not be the best trial uh, for this patient because this trial is more for patients with tumors that um, did not undergo surgical resection yet. Okay, thank you. We do have oh, some trials mm -hmm. that are specifically tailored to patients that have had their tumor resected, especially if they've undergone neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, and they, because they have higher risk of recurrence. So we have one um, that is sponsored um, through Moffitt. Um, it's sponsored by the Department of Defense where we actually give these vaccines out um, for patients after they complete chemotherapy that have residual tumor. Um, we need to um, develop a similar uh, type of trial for patients that have triple negative breast cancer because there are uh, some of those around. Um, and we don't have a specific trial for those that are ER positive, but the ER positive patients have anti-estrogen um, pills that they take after surgery that does a pretty good job for the most part of helping to reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, so thank you all for those answers. And to, to piggyback on that, there's a question about, um, with regard to the data on estrogen positive, you discussed how long, uh, you, that you discussed, how long does it generally take to get um, to a point where a clinical trial begins? So um, for this type of clinical trial, it could almost be begun as soon as it can be written and approved by the FDA because um, as Ricardo has said, we've already proven the safety of the, yeah. the cells um, be administered to patients. So it would just be a matter of changing instead of um, the HER2 and HER3 that he was talking about uh, adding um, peptides or little bits of the protein from the ER receptor to treat. So a, a trial like that could actually be put together and started in, in six months. Okay. And then um, another uh, viewer asked, um, if you have a recurrence of cancer, are you now ineligible for any further trials? No, I can get on one before. I can I can take that. Uh, no, it doesn't necessarily render you ineligible um, if you've had a recurrence. Um, so we do have trials that are actually geared towards trying to help women who've had a metastatic recurrence, uh, for example, of their of their breast cancer, um, and trying to use immunotherapy approaches to see if we can 
um, try to target the cancer. Um, so, so that way, you know, if they're able to participate, uh, the criteria isn't so much whether or not they've uh, relapsed, we expect them to have relapsed, but there may be other criteria that are used in order to determine their eligibility. But so just by virtue of them relapsing, it doesn't make them ineligible for any study. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, we have a question that probably I'm going to punt to um, Carrie. Um, if a patient's making a donation for breast cancer research, how specific can that patient be in focusing on certain types of breast cancer, certain types of trials, or applying the donation to a specific investigator? How, how does somebody do that, uh, Carrie? That's a great question. And that's kind of one of the reasons that I work so closely with the breast program is that I can work specifically with patients to help them or families to help you all identify how you want to make your greatest impact within the breast cancer program. So that can be in a disease area, that can be for a specific clinical trial um, or just general need. We can really work with you to find the best need and kind of work, drill down in spe specificity to find the best match for you and your family and your philanthropic investment. Okay, thank you. I would echo that, um, that how, however someone wants their um, donation to be utilized, we will um, utilize it according to your wishes. Um, I know we're coming on seven o'clock now. Um, we still have everybody hanging on. I can't believe it. Nobody's really Great. falling off. So I wanted to just get to a couple more questions if, if everybody's okay with that. Um, just because they're such great questions, I hate I hate to not get them answered for 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 people out there. Um, how much are these uh, immunotherapy, cellular genetics, and now viral treatments being uh, considered or employed in a general care institution, meaning outside of an NCI designated cancer center like Moffitt? What about in the community? Are patients going to have access to this, or is this exclusive to large institutions like Moffitt? So let me um, address that one. So I, I mentioned that we had a trial for patients that um, had residual tumor in their um, breast or axillary nodes after um, neoadjuvant, but meaning that they got chemo before and at the time of surgery, the surgeon still found some, some tumor left uh, after treatment. Well, we've designed these therapies so that they can be, these cells, can be obtained anywhere in this country or around the world. They can be shipped to a facility to make the vaccines for the patient. And then they are shipped frozen back to the site from where the patient lives so that they can get that treatment near their house or near their home. They have to probably, because they're on trial, have to go into a, a hospital or a center. And, and that's already underway with this clinical trial because there are nine centers around the country that um, are giving these same vaccines out. Um, so the other day we have a patient that had her cells collected in Seattle, Washington. So the complete opposite end of the country. And we manufactured her vaccines and they're about to be shipped back to um, Seattle, Washington for her to receive her treatments. So it is possible to be done when approved at, at any hospital size, um, anywhere where apheresis can be done. And most apheresis can be done even in a Red Cross Center um, of which there are numerous in, in most cities. So um, maybe we'll wrap up with this um, last question, or actually second to last question. Um, what can we as dendritic cell immunotherapy recipients, so someone on, uh, in the viewing audience tonight has been undergoing immunotherapy, she, and she says, what can I do? What can we do to help encourage other patients for this type of treatment? We are so thankful and want to help reduce their fear. Spread the word. Tell your friends. <laughs> we actually, um, it's, it's interesting because we've, we've talked with our people in uh, marketing and outreach because we try to produce content um, about patients who've participated in clinical trials at Moffitt. They love those stories because it 
does help patients immensely when they see others like them who've been through the studies and had positive experiences and who are real believers in the work that Brian's doing and um, have followed them around, you know, and so that dedication goes a long way to, to encouraging people to participate. So I think, you know, we want to be able to get your stories out there and it would be great if we could connect with, with those patients through Brian and Penny's and actually to try to get some of those types of stories out there to encourage more participation and get the word out, like you said. And then um, I have a question that I think might be important to our viewing audience to give them some sort of uh, framework of what we're talking about to take some the, these clinical trials from inception to the execution of the trial to the outcomes and then the broader use of, of the therapies. What does it cost to do, do a trial like this? Like Dr. Costa, you have a trial you presented tonight. What does it really take, monetarily speaking, to get this off the ground and get it completed? And then uh, the last question after Dr. Costa will go to Dr. Zernicki, which is what is the next big thing uh, in research for breast cancer? And then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up tonight. Yeah, uh, the cost is definitely high uh, in, um, in my view. And uh, uh, we, we have to keep in mind, right, that this is all technology that is uh, developed at, uh, at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, and translated in, into into clinics. So this, this is not coming from a pharma company that we can just get the drugs and tests, right? So there's a lot of steps involved. So for instance, I could share with you that uh, for this trial, for the conduct of the trial and the vaccines, I'm not counting some of the um, ancillary studies that we wanna conduct to learn more about certain aspects of the um, immune system. The cost is estimated at $750,000 just for the conduct of the trial for to treat the patients with the vaccines and make sure um, that uh, everything's done properly. So uh, yeah, that, that would be, uh, hands as Dr. Zerninki alluded to, we, we certainly need um, support to conduct these very independent uh, treatment um, strategies because not, not all immune therapy is the same. What we're doing at Moffitt is not what you see on TV, on the commercials. It is a different type of um, immune therapy, which is specific, um, individualized for each patient. Okay, Brian, if you wanna you know, wrap us up tonight, what's the next big thing? Can you prophesize where all this is going for our audience tonight? Well, since immunotherapy is already here, we, we won't <laughs> count that. Okay. But I would say the next big thing that's on the horizon is going to be what the gut does through either probiotics, uh, dietary intake, um, caloric restrictions. Those kind of things are going to have a powerful influence through the immune system. And I think we're going to get closer and closer to being able to come up with a formula that prevents breast cancer by doing that. All right. Well, I think um, you know we've run out of time and I want to thank um, everyone for being here tonight. For all of you who spent your um, Thursday evening with us, um, you could be doing a lot of other things or maybe not in a pandemic, I don't know, but you know, thank you for being here and listening and seeing what we're doing. It's always a pleasure for us to bring to you what we do behind the scenes that sometimes isn't so well known. And I think um, in some of the comments uh, tonight, you can see that um, we rely on you. Uh, we can't do any of this without you and your generosity, your philanthropy, and, um, you know, being a moffeteer and a cheerleader for us so that we can try to improve the lives of our patients um, by innovative and groundbreaking therapies. So I'd love to do this again. I had a lot of fun, and um, I hope everyone has a good evening and be safe out there. And if we have another one, we'd love to see you again and tell all your friends. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.